It's the most wonderful time of the year, the NBA offseason, Christmas in July. What's up guys, it's Austin Short, back with another episode of Not Your Father's Sports Show. And today, we are going to review all of the biggest moves of the NBA offseason. It's been an unprecedented offseason full of transactions involving some of the biggest names in the league, so let's get right into it. All year we heard murmurs and rumblings of Kevin Durant wanting to get out of Golden State despite winning two championships in three seasons while in the Bay. It seemed like he never got the validation he was looking for and wanted to turn the page. And no matter what you say, I will always believe the argument that ensued after this play was part of the reason Durant was not interested in staying. So now Durant turns the page to a new chapter with the Brooklyn Nets after a sign and trade deal that resulted in him and a first round protected pick being shipped to Brooklyn for D'Angelo Russell along with Shabazz Napier and Trayvon Graham, both of whom have already been moved to Minnesota. Durant decided to team up with free agents Kyrie Irving and DeAndre Jordan in Brooklyn. The three of them have been very close since their playing days on the national team in the 2016 Olympics and we saw Durant and Kyrie making eyes at each other at the All-Star game earlier this year when they were both on Team LeBron. The Nets, of course, were a surprise playoff team last year, earning the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference. They still maintain a young core of guys like Jared Allen, sharpshooter Joe Harris, Spencer Dinwiddie, Karis LeVert, and newly acquired Torian Prince. It will be interesting to see how Kyrie is able to lead this young group of guys while waiting for Durant to return from his Achilles injury, especially coming off his stint in Boston where he was supposed to take a young core to the next level and failed to do so. The Warriors didn't come away empty handed and you have to give them credit for that. They were able to acquire the 23 year old point guard D'Angelo Russell in the deal involving KD. It's a savvy move on their part picking up an asset for a guy that seemed dead set on leaving. But with Clay out for a good part of the next year, how will a backcourt of D'Lo and Steph Curry work? As the Warriors dynasty evolved, it seemed that Curry was involved with a lot more off-ball screens and less involved in the pick and roll game, part of which may be because of his turnover prone nature, and partially due to the fact that teams overcommit their defense so often when he is running off screens that it results in easy buckets underneath. You have to imagine D'Lo is going to be the main ball handler since that is what he is most effective at doing, especially in the pick and roll game, and when Clay does come back from the ACL injury, do you move him to the three and start all three of those guys? It's still possible that D'Angelo Russell gets moved, and I think it's more than likely considering the fact that a Russell and Curry backcourt has the potential to be a crippling defensive liability. Let's move on to the most recent offseason news. The Houston Rockets were able to get out from under that terrible Chris Paul contract by taking on the nearly equally as bad Russell Westbrook contract. It's a move that needed to be made from both sides, really. Paul and Harden clearly had some sort of disagreement and it seemed clear that they were never going to get over the hump. On the other hand, Westbrook most likely did not want to stick around after Paul George bolted. More on that shortly. From a strategy standpoint, it's hard to see how Westbrook fits in with the current Rockets strategy. If you think Chris Paul was tired of sitting on the wing waiting for his turn, how do you think that's going to go over with Russell Westbrook? In addition to that, Westbrook shot 29% from three-point range last year, and as we all know, the Rockets have led the league in three-point attempts in the last three seasons. Something's got to give. I don't think the Rockets need to de-emphasize their three-point game, but I think it would be beneficial to Westbrook if they picked up the pace. As mentioned earlier, the LA Clippers shocked everyone when they were not only able to sign Kawhi Leonard, but they also traded for Paul George. What it do, baby? Yeah. Goodbye, super teams of yesteryear, and say hello to the season of dynamic duos. This Clippers team has gone from a nice story last year to a legitimate title contender and have done so very quickly since moving on from their Lob City days. I'm so excited to see how Patrick Beverly, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George are able to disrupt games defensively next year. 
I think that the obvious weakness for this team is a lack of playmaking, but they have bona fide bucket getters in Kawhi, Paul George, and Lou Williams. Overall, I love the depth of this team, and one area where it appears they have the edge over their crosstown rivals is in the coaching department. Doc Rivers is still one of the best in the biz. Moving on to the Lakers, Braun finally got his wish and shipped away the young bucks for perennial all-star Anthony Davis. While they weren't able to nab Kawhi, they did grab Boogie Cousins to reunite the two big men. They were also able to get Danny Green and Avery Bradley, but the most important part of the Lakers offseason? Resigning stud point guard Alex Caruso. So what he looks like a substitute teacher, or an accountant. He's half bald, half amazing, and has serious bounce. Don't start Brown at the point. Let the bald Mamba take the reins of this team. That's how the Lakers get back to the finals. Going to do a little more quick fire stuff on the rest of the league before we finish this video up. And if you're enjoying this, please like, subscribe, comment, share, tell your grandma about it. You know, all that good stuff. Sneaky good team in the West could be the Utah Jazz. Getting Mike Conley in at the point is an upgrade. I think it remains to be seen how big of an upgrade this is, but he's certainly a more well-rounded player than Ricky Rubio. And they made some nice pickups with Bogdanovich, Jeff Green, and Ed Davis as well. I'm very intrigued by what the Sixers have done. That starting lineup is huge. Shortest guy is 6'6", six, six, and four of the five are at least 6'9". Anchoring the paint with Embiid and Horford is going to make this team one of the best defenses in the league. Especially paired up with the newly acquired Josh Richardson and Ben Simmons, they have certainly lost some depth, but wouldn't be surprised to see them make some more additions along the way since they are a contender in the East. Quickly on the Thunder here, it's obvious they are rebuilding. Kind of a cool note, this isn't the first time CP3 has played in OKC. Remember the Oklahoma City Hornets? But let's consider all of these picks they just got for Paul George and Russell Westbrook, 11 picks in total. Theoretically, if they use these picks and pick some of the youngest players possible in these drafts, they could have traded two top 15 NBA players for five high schoolers and six middle schoolers. That's pretty crazy. And of course, I gotta talk about my Pistons. Didn't really make any splash moves, but we did get rid of John Luer, hallelujah, or Tony Snell, you know, nice little player there. You got, you got yourself a nice little player, Tony Snell. And a late first round pick, which we later moved for four second round picks. So that's just, you know, more assets that we can move in the future. Snell figures to be in the mix to start at small forward, and if not, will certainly play a role with the team somehow. The biggest signing the Stones made was bringing in fan favorite Derrick Rose, and former MVP Derrick Rose. He was relatively healthy last year, playing in 51 games. It's kind of sad that 51 games is relatively healthy for him, but I would say it's an improvement. And he was surprisingly effective from beyond the arc, shooting 37% on threes and also averaged 18 points last year. This still isn't D. Rose of the past, but we got him relatively cheap. He can't come in and take Reggie's spot. Sorry, Pistons fans, I know that's what we were hoping for. But he can be an effective spark plug off the bench. He still needs to be on a load management protocol in order to get the most out of him, though. You have to limit his minutes and even have him take nights off from time to time in order to have him for the long haul. Alright, that's all we have for today, folks. Thanks for watching. Please uh, subscribe if you haven't. Hit that like button. Give me a comment. I'm all ears, people. Love to hear from you. It's not your